to the Conception Channel Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Conception Channel Podcast brought to you by Instill Reproductive Wellness. I am your host, Spence Pentland. And today I'm excited to speak with uh, Laura Gilstrap. She is, we're going to talk all things uh, PCOS and diet and lifestyle. Um, but first, uh, just quick housekeeping. If you're on Apple iTunes podcast, can you scroll down, give a quick review after you love what we talk about? Uh, or if you're listening to this on or watching it on YouTube, uh, maybe subscribe and give a like. But anyway, without further ado, let's uh, hop into all things PCOS diet and lifestyle. Welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you, Spence. I am so excited to be here. Excellent. Excellent. So uh, we were, I, we met on Clubhouse. Um, shout out to Clubhouse. Uh, we've got a weekly or I, I'm hopping on there weekly now with a little Q&A Wednesdays at 11 Pacific. But uh, it was really nice to, to meet you on there. And you're speaking to something very similar, but different, you know, more endometriosis. But uh, um, we chose to go into PCOS because I know at the end of that talk, you're like, well, I'd like to talk about PCOS and, and can you give everyone a bit of a background, um, on you and, and, uh, how we came to, to, to meet and talk about this topic? Sure. Yes. I think that you and I have similar, um, backgrounds from an educational standpoint and a knowledge standpoint when it comes to PCOS, but a little bit about, um, what I do and sort of how I came to do it. Um, I am a registered dietitian and licensed nutritionist here in the US. Um, I do telehealth consults uh, now thanks to COVID. Um, I have a uh, previously, um, you know, my previous experience in the nutrition world is in MNT, so medical nutrition therapy, where I was a clinical dietitian for years in a LTEC, which is a long-term acute care for the critically ill. I worked with a lot of vent-dependent patients and um, rehabbed patients. So we did a lot of uh, wound care, uh, GI issues, kidney disease, ICU patients. And so I got immersed in MNT and how the human body responds to food and the timing of food. And, and while I was doing that um, for years, I had also been undergoing uh, fertility treatments or infertility treatments myself. So for the past eight years, um, I've been undergoing treatment to try to have a kid. I was diagnosed with PCOS in 2013. And, and prior to that, I had um, regular periods and no issue, mm. no signs and symptoms of any PCOS. Granted, I, I was on birth control for about 10 years, but prior to that regular cycles, um, you know, just a little, because we're on audio, I wasn't, I don't look like your typical and I'm putting typical in air quotes, mm -hmm. uh, PCOS patient, you know, I'm a 120 pounds, I'm five, seven, I'm athletic. I have a healthy, uh, normal BMI, um, regular periods, no thinning hair, excess facial hair, nothing like that. Um, and so a month after my husband and I got married, we decided to start a family and I immediately lost my period. And mm -hmm. so I went to the doctor, was immediately diagnosed with PCOS and they got me right in to start fertility treatments and, and that gauntlet, which included oral meds and timed relations turned into injectables, which turned into IUIs, which eventually turned into um, two rounds of IVF egg retrievals. And of those two rounds, um, my daughter was conceived and produced. And I, I do have a three and a half year old now, but since she has been, um, since I've had her, we've, um, had multiple more tra multiple transfers and additional um, IVF egg retrieval cycle. We got six embryos and of those, we did not genetically test of those six. Um, I have thus then since then uh, miscarried four of those most mm. recently about three weeks ago. So I am, I am in the thick of IVF treatment and still um, advocating for the women like myself that are in it and educating and just trying to um, make sure that nobody 
feels like I feel and, and goes through what I, th I go through. And, you know, I'm just a small piece of the healthcare puzzle for women who are undergoing treatment. But I do believe that nutrition is crucial from a mind, body and soul standpoint. So um, because of all this, I guess, turmoil that I've had, I, uh, I opened up my private practice in 2017 and have been doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, consulting with women who want to conceive naturally all the way to postpartum, a lot of PCOS, I'll say 90% of my business is PCOS, little endo mm -hmm. sprinkled in there, but I see all of it, thyroid issues, mm -hmm. uh, diminished ovarian reserve, IVF prep, you name it. Um, I, I want to work with it. Wow. Okay. So <clears throat> coming from an, a standpoint of expertise and, and then uh, a fertility warrior uh, to boot. Wow. So you um, boots on the ground and, and academic have, uh, uh, a lot to say, I'm, I'm sure clearly. So thank you for, for taking the time out to be here. I, um, <clears throat> uh, so interesting. I'm first of all, sorry, rewinding. I'm sorry about your recent loss. I mean, that's, that's very recent and, and, and I had no idea. So I'm sorry um, to hear about that. Thank you. Um, yes, it was a second trimester loss. And that was, oh, yeah. that was a blow to us because in during IVF, I really couldn't get past that six week heartbeat ultrasound. Um, and that's where we kept going um, wrong. So um, this one to happen, but you know, um, Spence, that, that wasn't our baby. This wasn't our time. And so now we're going to um, keep moving forward and you know, we're going to try again. We're going to do another IVF cycle. Um, I meet with my physician here um, in two weeks to just sort of get a plan. I do much better mentally when I can look forward to something in the future. And so while we are still going to be taking some time off for my body and my mind to still heal and sort of our family to come together, um, we just, we're going to get a game plan. And so, you know, I know that you will definitely follow along and I'm hoping that any of your listeners will follow along in my, my journey. I, I do put it up on my social because I think that, um, we shouldn't have this topic be taboo and I don't want to hide from it. And I want the public to know what, you know, you called me a warrior and that's what I do call this population. Um, I want us warriors to be heard and be seen. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. Just while you mention it, I mean, and right at the start, instead of at the end, where are your right. social, uh, you're on IG, I think, and are you on Facebook or are you, and how do people find you? Sure. Um, yes. I'm on a couple of the platforms, uh, cause I can't do them all. I just don't have time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, Instagram is mostly where I will, um, post my stories. And then that obviously trickles into Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I have a Pinterest account. So if people are interested in recipes, that's where I put those. And oh, also, that's great. Yeah. Yep. I, I, um, everything sort of home base is my blog, um, right off my website. And so those feed into the other social accounts and it's just Laura underscore Gilstrap is where you can find me. Okay. So all those, Laura, I'll get you to, uh, forward those all to me like nice and succinctly and I'll put them in show notes. So, uh, so wherever people are listening to this, they can kind of just scroll down and, and have a click to their preferred platform as well. Um, so thank you for sharing those. So, okay. Wow. So you've <clears throat> been through IVFs and, and, and FETs and uh, uh, congratulations on, on, your little toddler though, that is, that's, uh, that's did, how, how did he or she come to, to grace you in the world? Was that through, uh, uh, an assisted cycle or. It was, um, she, her name is Logan and she, um, came, we had her in 2017 and it was from a frozen embryo cycle. Um, mm -hmm. we had, uh, she was PGS tested. So we knew that she was normal. Um, and she has been to California before I have, that's where, <laughs> that's where they did our testing. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, she's wonderful. And she's a, awesome. um, a great first child to have, or, you know, we, 
we want to give her a sibling. We don't know yeah. if she wants one, but that's our goal. Yeah. If that doesn't happen, then we're going to be okay with it um, because she is a, a delight. And I, you know, I still look at her and just wonder how, how we got so lucky, how this miracle Aww. is made. You know, these people are, uh, you know, they look at their spouses and they say, Hey, do you want to have, um, you want to try for a baby this month? And then they just get to have a baby and that's not my path. So, you know, all the work and the money and the time and the tears that went into her, it's just still mesmerizing that, mm -hmm. you know, the universe said, okay, this is the egg that's going to turn into a baby and it's going to be healthy and you get to keep her. I'm like, wow. You know, after having four miscarriages, I'm like, you know, she made it like she's the little embryo that made it. And I just think, you know, I love science so much and I'm so grateful for IVF and ART and, and being able to even have the option because some people don't even have the option. It's very yeah. expensive. Um, yeah. I mean, I have clients who are petrified of needles and I have to like send them videos of like where to intramuscularly <laughs> inject it, right. you know? Yeah. Oh, so yes, they're all such gifts. Hey, I, the little ones and it's, you know, it's really why so many work so hard and become that warrior to get to that place. I think even before you have children, there's an instinct there and I and and congratulations. I'm I'm happy for you. That's wonderful. So I'm I assume there's um little one pictures on your Instagram that people can see. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. she's mm -hmm. she's all over there. But I, you know, as as a warrior, I like to be conscious of triggers um, because I know like when I see a pregnancy announcement or a child, you know, you don't know people's background, but you still try to. Yeah. Um, be conscious of it. I mean, it's the world that we live in, my, well, that I, I, I live in, one in eight of us live in. Yeah. Well, I think uh, people coming to you, knowing what you've been through, listening to this, or however they come to you, knowing, I think uh, Logan um, would be inspiration, you know, and, um, you know, just a reminder of why, you know, they're exercising again or, eating a kale smoothie again, or, you know, all the things, you know, that uh, really do, you know, help, you know, take us steps closer to it, to, to the goal, you know? So, well, thank you for that background. That was wonderful. So, I mean, uh, now let's, we'll shift gears a tiny bit to your, to not just your, your practical, you know, um, knowledge and experience, but you're academic as well. So you've been, um, you're a dietitian and, and nutritionist, both. I love that combination because there's some differences there. And, and maybe, can you speak to that really quickly just for people? Because I, I it's a, a point of confusion, I think for many, the difference. Great question. And now let me ask you a question. Is it the same in Canada? <laughs> It, it, I, I don't, if you tell me, it probably is. I mean, it's uh, um, a dietitian would be more, uh, the, up here at least they work in hospitals and they're very closely tied into um, teams with physicians and, and, and nurses to counsel on usually, you know, more uh, prevalent, you know, medical conditions. Uh, a nutritionist would be, have gone through more of a, a holistic study, including things from Chinese medicine to Ayurveda to science to, you know, uh, and, and everything in between. And, but they're not, uh, uh, they don't have their own professional body, which would be a major difference. So I, I, I could go on, but I think is that kind of, that's kind of how it is here. Yes. And same here. So, uh, a registered dietitian, dietitian, uh, attended an accredited school and then sits for, um, well, ha then has to obtain a thousand hours of clinical study. And we call that an internship in the um, MD world. That's sort of equivalent to their residency. Right. Uh, and then we sit for a, an exam, a board, our boards. Um, a nutritionist uh, can get a degree from, you can become a, actually really anybody can kind of call themselves a nutritionist. I guess. Or a health coach. Mm -hmm. um, and 
those two can sort of go hand in hand. And that you're right, it takes more of a holistic approach. You can't, if you're a nutritionist, like you can't be hired on at a, at a hospital or at a medical facility, and uh, you wouldn't qualify for some of those recommendations that the state puts on these yeah. facilities. Yeah. So you are the best of both worlds, in my in my opinion, because <laughs> insurance would cover you, and but yes. you'd, and you'd have the science and the, you know, more traditional or holistic ideas as well to to share with people. So a very well rounded um, academic stance on on uh, how to get people eaten um, according to their condition a little better. Yes, perfectly said. It is definitely tied to the condition because what you put in your body can certainly affect certain organs. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, okay. So, you, so as we, on that stacked on top of you having, um, which you, I know you air quoted atypical PCOS phenotype, you know, a, a more thin type, maybe a, a, a term people might be familiar with, but, um, um, and without a lot of the classical science, but maybe, um, maybe we could, where would you like to start, Laura? Because I mean, there, there's, that's a different clinical picture entirely. Maybe there's insulin resistance and hyperandrogenism, but nothing else, or maybe there's cystic ovaries, you know, but there isn't the typical things, obesity and, and some of these, uh, uh, anovulation, et cetera. But can you, do you maybe want to kind of run through the different, you know, types of PCOS that are out there and then we can kind of drill into, to, to how to eat and different lifestyle ideas for each. Sure. Um, so my PCOS, so let's, I guess, We'll, t- we'll start with, I'm going to call it thin PCOS because that's okay. the term that's sort of on the internet, but okay. uh, sometimes it can offend people. And I understand that. Um, yeah. So with thin PCOS, you don't have the obesity factor. Um, mm-hmm. You don't have the um, association with other metabolic diseases. Uh, you don't have the um, increased BMI, typical cholesterol, lipid levels can possibly be elevated, those Mm -hmm. types of things. Um, You could also have um, regular cycles. Um, I particularly did not. So I have irregular cycles and insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. And that can also be um, correlated with a thin PCOSers. When it does come to your standard picture of a PCOS woman, it is um, excess body fat or a um, elevated BMI. So, you know, outside of the normal range, which is a BMI uh, above 25 and um, acne or oily skin, you have thinning hair or baldness. Um, You typically have the facial hair that um, we see. Uh, You have cysts on your ovaries, which is something that I also have. Painful periods can sometimes be associated with it. Very, not all the time, but um, right. some of the times. And then excessive weight gain. So big fluctuations in weight gain, uh, particularly around the midsection right. is another clear sign. And I see a lot of women who just gain 60 or 70 pounds and two quarters, you know, or like one year, and they just don't understand why this is happening. And so once you go in, uh, you could see all the the hormones that have become abnormal. So typically, we're also looking at um, abnormal testosterone, DHEA levels, Uh, you can you, I think, can probably talk to more abnormal um, labs that will come back than probably than I can. It's more androgenic or male hormone levels. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That's would be lending themselves to the acne and, and, you know, hirsutism and, and or hair growth and hair loss. And yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. What's going on inside of you is definitely a reflection of what's going on outside of you. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Right. Well, some things hide, you know, the lipids might hide a bit, but, <laughs> but yeah, it's on. And, and so this weight gain, you know, obviously, um, uh, puts people into risk of, uh, pre-diabetes and, and something that is, uh, um, 
um, you know, typical with, with uh, uh, PCOS, correct? That is correct. You become sort of, uh, I mean, it can manifest as pre-diabetics or sometimes as a, as a full-blown diabetic and you don't really know. And then, you know, in that you're, you're hurting your organs and you need functioning, functioning livers and for cleaning out the blood and you need your pancreas working correctly. And we need all reproductive organs firing on all cylinders going into fertility treatments. Right. But the insulin resistance is pre-diabetes is definitely one of the biggest right. um, factors that I try to address when it comes to my PCOS patients. And I believe now, correct me if I'm wrong, but about 80% of women diagnosed with PCOS are insulin resistance. Did I, am I right? Well, you know what, I, I, I just was going through a, a, a study a couple of days ago or an article, sorry, a bit of a review, and it was somewhere in that vicinity too. You know, I try and um, keep myself um, a, a little bit of a anti-stat zone, but I, I, it, that's very close to what I saw. Yeah. Um, and, and that is uh, something that is under addressed. I, I agree. And, and that can be in in thin type or uh, typical PCOS patients, right? That is correct. Mm -hmm. I'm a I'm walking proof of it. Yeah. Well, what? Okay. And and I'm sure we'll get way more into that. But just an aside, there's, you know, concomitantly or at the same time, uh, other things. Uh, it it PCOS polycystic ovary syndrome. Syndrome is the key piece to that to that name. Um, and I know some, some, you know, uh, groups, you know, call it different things, but, uh, um, the syndrome part definitely is correct because you're talking about, um, metabolic and, and weight concerns. You're talking about, uh, cystic ovaries. You're talking about male hormone excesses, talking about an ovulatory or irregular menstrual cycles. So there's a whole lot of things going on there. Um, or could be not that doesn't necessarily have to be, but um, which all can really impact fertility, but on, um, as it, you know, some things that come along with PCOS, there's, you know, I, you hear that endometriosis isn't that uncommon with women with PCOS or thyroid conditions, or are there some other typical things that you want to kind of peek at quickly? And then we'll jump back to, to the re insulin resistance. Sure. Um, well, definitely endo um, is something that I see a lot of, and and you could probably speak more to this than I can. But sometimes the endometriosis diagnosis is not a hundred percent proven. You know, it's been just sort of given when a patient talks about their signs and symptoms. But you know, for those listening, we we know that endometriosis is the over overgrowth of tissue outside of the of the uterine cavity and right. causes a lot of things: inflammation, pain, mostly pain. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and then I definitely see a lot of thyroid. Um, I see hypothyroid a lot Hypo, correlated yeah. with PCOS, mm -hmm. and when I treat those two conditions together, you sort of have to find the perfect balance. You're not going to hit the nail on the head um, within the first 30 or 60 days to find out what's working or what's not. Because when it comes to um, hypothyroidism or th any thyroid condition, really, th it does not respond very well to a low to moderate carb right. diet, just mm -hmm. like PCOS actually does when we're trying to uh, implement glycemic control. So when I have a patient that is struggling with thyroids, we have to find that sweet spot when we are assigning certain macros. And, and, and I mean, the, the, I always get asked about supplements right. and I'm very weary to recommend supplements when it comes to the thyroid, um, right. because mm -hmm. typically you're on a good dose of uh, some sort of medication, levothyroxine, something like that. Yeah. And so I definitely do not like to overstep my boundary because the physician is very particular about this because it can certainly um, affect you pre baby. And then when there is a fetus in you, you know, right. uh, if you're, I believe it's T3. 
TSH, yeah. that's what it is. Yep. That is just slightly elevated, even like within its normal parameters and cause brain brain issues with the fetus. So I, I like to stay out of that world, but right. uh, nutritionally, I, I certainly can play. And so you see those two conditions mostly go hand in hand with your PCOS patients. Right. So yeah, just to, you, to stick with thyroid just for, for a, a moment, um, often... Um, Often I see, and I almost to a, some degree, I think in my practice, assume that there's some autoimmune component maybe with the thyroid and more that Hashimoto or um, whether it's been sitting in uh, hypothyroid for, for years or not, there might be some anyway. I just think any body under any degree of stress and, and you know, um, inflammation for any period of time, there's going to be some modulation there. But um so there's, there's what I'm trying to get at is that there's just a lot that can be done from a diet perspective, let alone, you know, aside from supplements, you know, I would only, you know, vitamin D and probiotics and, and some fish oils, maybe, you know, to help modulate that. But that can you, do you, do you feel or see the same in your practice that there's, there's a lot of autoimmune with the, with the thyroid and that gives way to a bigger clinical picture? You know, my client, yes, yes. To answer your question. Yes. Um, I don't get a lot of autoimmune. A lot of my patients are coming from reproductive endocrinologists mm -hmm. and they, I'm being ref referred by them to, they are being referred to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when it comes to, you know, autoimmune, I, I'm, I'm typically asked to sort of stay out of it. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, yep. I'm putting that lightly, you know, just, you okay. know, stick, <laughs> stick to the, <laughs> and nobody's, no physician has actually called yep. me and yep. said, Hey, don't yep. talk about X, Y, and Z, but it's pretty much, you know, I think working in the hospital, I've, I've yeah, just there's unwritten agreements. Sure. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I like to stay in my lane and talk about the conditions that I specialize in. Um, you know, I do, I do address the thyroid autoimmune can definitely be addressed with food from an inflammatory standpoint yes. yeah. in yeah. certain diets uh, like the Mediterranean or paleo, the elimination of gluten or dairy, looking at your oils and all the things that we're probably going to talk about, which I hope we're going to yeah. talk about, but all of those can certainly be associated with uh, changes in an autoimmune, hopefully in an autoimmune condition. A lot of, a lot of studies, a lot of research are pointing toward anti-inflammatory omega-3 rich foods to help with certain conditions. So rheumatoid arthri arthritis, um, lupus, um, certain foods to uh, essentially calm down the system right. uh, is what I will address, you know, I, yeah. w I work toward. Yeah. I mean, inflammation, you know, it probably at least to some degree, if not the cause of most, <laughs> you know, involved in the conditions, any condition we see, but um, so, okay, I digress the, so let's jump into to PCOS in particular. And, and we mentioned insulin resistance and that being a place you said that, that you're focusing on often, is that a place you want to start and give, and we can chat about that and how to eat and, and some lifestyle things to address that, or are there some overarching um, uh, principles with PCOS that you want to, to kind of drill down on first? Let's start with the insulin resistance. Cause I believe that's a very important topic and people might be anxious to hear about them. And then we can talk more about the others. Um, because a lot, all, well, whether or not my, my clients or anybody comes to me and they have passed their, uh, fasting glucose exam and their numbers are great. That doesn't necessarily mean you aren't insulin resistant. Yes. Uh, an insulin, you know, an insulin resistance test is very specific and REs don't typically run them. Fertility clinics don't typically run them unless you're seeing a actual endocrinologist, a PCP would certainly not run that unless requested. But I always go under the assumption that you are. And plus it's, I believe that a lifestyle is better suited for any people uh, on the, you know, American or Canadian diet with our food chain and our food supply, if it isn't so processed and it isn't so um, carbohydrate heavy, um, man-made carbohydrate heavy. So 
I try to eliminate certain food items anyways. So I think just naturally controlling insulin from a nutritional standpoint is important for all humans, but definitely nailing down the right combination of macros for PCOS women is very important. And, you know, like we had talked about earlier, PCOS is so different from person to person. Mm. And and then we bring in other conditions that people are trying to deal with. Um, So you have to be very specific when it comes to, I believe, when it comes to working with a patient. I I know a lot of health coaches and nutritionists and dietitians that come out with these beat PCOS and and six weeks plan. And it's just generic. (laughs) Um, and, and that's fine because I think that that can certainly help a certain population, but sitting down and learning about what you are going through and your goals and your medications, your procedures, your lifestyle is extremely important. So, right. you know, I'm sort of rambling, but that's how I will address the patient. And then when it comes to talking about glycemic control, um, we know, let's just, let's assume that everybody's listening has PCOS and is struggling with carbohydrate management. So we know with PCOS that literature has been, is showing, is now showing that insulin resistance is tied to PCOS and vice versa. So um, by manning, managing your insulin and your sugars, which are essentially your carbohydrates, you are going to return to a proper ovulation pattern, you might get a period again, you're going to start to see changes in your hormones and essentially in your body. And that's, that's the goal. Um, Now, Spence, could you tell me how long and you I know you read a lot of research papers, and you're much better at me than me with that. Um, This insulin resistance theory and research is that new, old? When did this start to come about? Because when I when I was diagnosed in 2013, I felt lost and I couldn't find really any data to support this. I, I actually asked my reproductive endocrinologist, my fertility doctor at the time, I think around 2015, if I could have metformin. And she flat out said no. Oh my God, glucophage should be frontline, right? <laughs> And now it's handed out to almost every PCOS woman trying to have a baby. Right, right. Well, I no, I think you answered your own question. I, it, you know, the history of PCOS period has had, you know, such shifts every time, you know, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine or the European Society of Human Endocrinology and Reproduction, ESHRA, uh, <clears throat> meets that it seems like there's new criteria, you know, to properly diagnose, um, um, PCOS and, you know, um, it, you, I, the irony of it is, is you don't even, you know, need polycystic ovaries to be identified with, with the syndrome, you know, I, um, uh, so that, that tells you where the name, you know, why I focused on that syndrome part of it is it's just so many things. And no, to, to my understanding, I mean, still, um, I mean, I see it all the time as do you, and I still don't see it routinely, you know, um, fasting insulin or homo IR or some basic testing to look at insulin resistance done routinely. So it's still not, <laughs> nope. yeah, I've never had one. Yeah. In the eight, eight and a half years and three different clinics, they have never done one. Yeah. I just know, I just know my body. I know the way that I feel when I eat a carb rich diet. And then the way my cycle happens when I watch what I eat and I keep it in moderation. Um, and also when I was pregnant, I had gestational diabetes and I would test my sugars and I saw a huge difference, whether I added two ounces of taco meat to a taco versus one ounce, uh, my numbers would be through the roof. If I didn't have enough protein, I knew, I, I knew I could, I, I, something was, something is off in my body and I feel so much more uh, normal. I feel less anxious right. when I, when I have, um, a more robust and, and balanced diet. That is huge. I mean, I don't have uh, a client that isn't, you know, 
going through some level of anxiety. I mean, stack COVID on top, but let's just take that aside, just trying to conceive or manage PCOS or, you know, these are, uh, you know, if there's any anxiety um, or worry, which may in some part be a prerequisite to being a mom. I'm not positive about that yet, but um, we worry as, you know, as parents, but uh, it's there. So anything that can help that is amazing. I mean, you know, people refer to to being hangry, right? You've heard that term. <laughs> can, you, can you explain that glycemic, you know, connection a little bit to, to mood? So maybe that's a way of people kind of diagnosing themselves in a sense. Sure. So hangry is a true, true term. Um, and what essentially is happening is that you have bottomed out. Your sugars have bottomed out and your body is essentially transitioning it's it, your body's trying to find sugars so carbohydrates so all the macros you have fats carbs and proteins right. and they all do different things they're all stored in different areas but they all have different um, energy amounts tied to them so carbohydrates have four calories per gram right. and they are fast burning very quick burning um, calories and your body uses them first. So for energy to... for fuel, that's our primary source of fuel. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When I say energy, it's essentially meaning fuel or ca- a calorie is a unit of energy. Fuel. Yeah. Cool. Um, protein, you know, is, is stored and same and fat is also stored. So after the body, you eat a bunch of Car- carbohydrates. And I mean, that could be anywhere from like a sandwich to um, steamed veggies to ice cream. I mean, it, all of the, anything but an animal product has a carbohydrate. Right. Um, that is going to be the body's first line of energy. So you're going to use it. And then essentially when you get hangry or you bottom out, you have hit ground zero and your body is changing from a hormonal standpoint, your brain shifts, Um, the, the, uh, leptin and ghrelin, I had a a brain, brain fart for a minute in your, in your stomach. Those are the two hormones and CCK in your stomach are, are in there and they're going, we need more food. We need more food. And so you essentially are going into a like starvation mode and your body is searching for other forms of energy Mm -hmm. after it, you know, it's done with all of its carbohydrate fuel or glucose that it has used up, it will go into the liver, your liver will start to break down its stored um, glucose and start to produce a little bit more. And then after you have used up all of your carbohydrates, you're going to then begin to start breaking down fat for fuel. And that's essentially when we go into ketosis and we all know, you know, keto, it's such a buzzword. It's very trendy, but it, I mean, it, it works. And, um, so you start breaking down fat for fuel, you start breaking down ketones into fuel. And so that, you know, your hormones are going through this, um, sort of wax and waning, um, experience. And when it comes to PCOS, we are already so imbalanced we are already, our, our ovaries don't know how to talk to any of the other organs. And so we're already sort of in this limbo state. So by having these ups and downs with your hormones or your food intake, it, it, it's totally doing you a disservice. So when it comes to glycemic control, you sort of have to treat yourself like, like a diabetic. You right. have to say, um, I need to have a, a constant, small, steady stream of energy in my system at all times. And that's going to prevent those ups and downs, those hangry experiences. Right. Um, it's also going to help your pancreas, who is the producer of insulin, which right. then is going to talk to your ovaries to regulate your cycle in a very short version, yeah. um, <laughs> that ins- that insulin isn't going to have to work so hard. Right. Your pancreas is going to get a break and it's going to actually do what it's meant to do. You know, we, when the human body was created, it wasn't created a hundred million years ago to eat all this manufactured, processed, mm-hmm. disgusting food. You know, we needed, right. you know, it's, it's used to 
eat basic foods, your basic food groups, the stuff that grows from the earth and isn't pumped full of hormones and extra, you know, processed food, preservatives, MSG, like the body, you know, we we're conditioned the body will transform and overcome, try to overcome uh, all of these disgusting inflammatory products. But at the end of the day, it's doing nobody good. Uh, absolutely. So, okay. So, and, and sugar would be, you know, is the epitome of all of this, you're talking carbohydrates, but for anyone, you know, to simplify it, the carbohydrates are broken down into sugar. And so any carbohydrate or simple sugar is sugar. It's yep. yeah. But, sugar. Okay. But, but all carbohydrates are not made the same. Uh, um, yeah. Okay. Which, yeah. Please explain a whole another topic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, give, give people a Coles notes on that because right now they're like, Oh, I shouldn't eat carbohydrates. Carbs. I just need to go on keto and, and keto, from my understanding, you know, being in that state is tough on the population of reproductive years, uh, or women in their reproductive years. And they're, yeah. you know, so it's not advisable to be, to my understanding and to what I recommend to be, to be, unless there's a lot of weight to be lost, maybe to be playing with ketogenesis. I'm glad you just said that last part because I think when you and I were talking on that, that clubhouse app, I got to thinking after it, you know, there, there is a, there is a population that, that keto can be very appropriate for. Mm. And, you know, I have a lot of women who come to me here in the U S that their doctors will not treat them until their BMI is below 40. And so, and, and, you know, they might be, of advanced maternal age. And so time is not on their side. And with keto, there is a rapid weight loss. Keto is not a forever um, diet. It should be right. done. If you are considering it, it should be done under the supervision of a dietitian or a physician. I would definitely talk to them about any other underlying health conditions that you have too. So here's my disclaimer for keto, yeah. Yeah. but it can, it can be done safely and properly. If you are looking to lose weight, uh, fast, but make sure, you know, you are doing it with a professional because there are some consequences that can come with it. But for those of you who are thinking carbohydrates are bad, they're actually not. So they're, they're actually a totally necessary element for the human body and particularly for women with PCOS and anybody with diabetes or pre-diabetic. But the goal is to have the right carbohydrates at the right time and in the right amount. So let me go through that. So yeah. the right, the right carbohydrates, the best ones for the, for the body are, um, your, any, so your whole grains, it, let's say you don't have any gluten intolerance. So we're talking the healthy, we're talking complex carbohydrates. And if right. you were good to Google that, um, the scientific world with, um, saccharides and things that I will not talk about, but we want yeah. complex carbs. And that means carbohydrates that are not, um, broken down into their simple form into that, you know, they're not stripped of all their nutrients. They still retain all of their B vitamins, all of your um, other minerals, you still have all the fiber intact with it. So the right. list for, um, for that is, you know, if we want to go into grains, it's whole grains, it's anything that is of the wheat, the oat, um, the, the brown grain. So the breads, um, brown rices, um, I mean, you can have whole grain English muffins, things, things like that. Right. Um, and then we're going to have the healthy vegetables, whether that is um, your greens, obviously. And I know Spence, we definitely Almost. talked about greens, anything in the green category is fine. It's, it's wonderful and in abundance yeah. um, as many servings a day as you want. And then you have your, your root vegetables and your tubers. Um, those are your potatoes and your yams and your starchy grown in the ground vegetables. Now those are also a carbohydrate. Those are heavier in carbs. So those are going to affect your pancreas and your insulin um, more heavily. So doing those in moderation, maybe once a day um, would be best for you. Um, if we're going to do fruit when it comes to PCOS and that again, yep, is another carbohydrate. Now fruit has a type of sugar called fructose um, and that is a natural sugar. So, you know, when, when, uh, when you said Spence earlier, like let's watch your sugars. He, 
he and I are both encouraging our listeners right now to do your white sugars, to just get rid of all um, white, simple sugars, anything right. that comes in like a pastry, a cake, an ice cream, yeah. anything that comes from a box manufactured um, product, we should, you should either have a, use that as like a treat for yourself as a reward for yourself, uh, but don't use it as a crutch and then try to definitely eliminate it because it it's addictive, right? So you, you know, <laughs> It's very hard to kick sugar, uh, your Coca-Colas, your sodas. I know people, I actually, sidebar, I had an ex-boyfriend. I've been married for a decade, but I had an ex-boyfriend who had to wake up in the middle of the night to drink his Diet Coke. I was disgusted. Uh, he went through like 10 of them a day. He was heavily addicted. So I have a lot of people who come to me who, you know, they use soda as their coping mechanism. I'm yeah. glad that they're using that over a cigarette or a, yeah. or a beer, but um Jeez. Uh, it still can be very addictive and it does, it does nothing to, to help your body. It has no, um, nutritional value to it. It's addictive right. and it's just going to, um, it, it's going to sit on your waistline. It's going to have a negative effect on your outcomes. And it is a pro inflammatory. Yeah. If we, if we say, if I say that word too much during yeah. this talk, yeah. um, <laughs> The irony. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but I no, mean, no, no. That that's one of the home. one of the things that you know PCOS women really need to focus on is um, reducing inflammation. And sugars, of all things, are extremely pro-inflammatory. And also, when I say sugars, I want white sugars. But then you know, all your uh, Splendas, your sweet and lows, any yeah. of those man-made sweeteners, they yeah. are. 800 to a thousand times sweeter than regular yeah. sugar. They make you um, addicted as well. Hey, they do. And I know that they, you know, they're, they were toted as a great option for people who have diabetes and struggle with glycemic control because they move through your system undigested, yeah. but they're yeah. doing, I mean, the research is showing terrible things to the rest of your body. So, yeah. um, I always ask, uh, if you like, if you're a baker, and you're like, I love to bake. It's a stress reducer. I don't want to give it up. There are certainly better alternatives yeah, for yeah. those ingredients, like your Truvias and your monk fruits, your yeah. Swerve, anything. You know, there's a million different brands coming out these days. Yeah. So look for plant-based sweeteners like that if you are just dying to keep baking it. Listen, I bake. I'm actually coming out with a with a cookbook for for desserts for people with PCOS because oh, I think wonderful. It is, I think it's so important. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I mean, going through the pandemic, I feel like everybody started baking. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and and just from all of my experience in the clinic, I mean, I telling someone to stop sweets or, or to curb their sweet tooth is I I don't know. It's it it it's a big, it's a big battle. There's got to be alternatives and, and ways around it. And can I add glucose fructose or high fructose or high, um, high fructose corn syrup as ingredients for people to, to, to run away from, including those sugar alcohols, some of them, or at least that you're, you're talking about are alternative sweeteners. Cause they, they're super sweet. You know, they run past your, your pancreas, you know, undetected, you know, which I guess is a good thing in some senses, but they create a, a, a craving for sweet that is almost insatiable. So inevitably there's going to be a turn back to white refined sugar at some point, just because that's what's at arm's reach. Yep. And it and for those of you who are listening and, and don't actually know what high fructose corn syrup is, it's in so many things. Monsanto gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. And and it's a man-made um, oil. So it has a hydrogen removed from it. And that hydrogen removal has shown to um, increase people's risk of cancer. Yeah. And this is, this is why it is so bad. Um, and it's well, in everything. It's in everything, all your pop, every, and it's, and it's not only that, just one extra layer. And then we digress. I, it's um, extracted from genetically modified corn. So, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure what that's doing. <laughs> yes. And well, I mean, we can, 
I definitely talked about this on that last podcast that we were on, but the, the GMO and the corn, somebody asked about, I think it was you, Spence, asked about um, the cattle that, and the beef that's being produced here in the U.S. and in Canada. Canada. Um, the beef, you know, cows are supposed to eat grass. That's their natural um, food. And so that's how their digestive systems that's what their digestive systems know. Yeah. But to make them fatter, we give them corn, which is genetically modified. Yeah. That corn can't be digested by those cows. So then we have to give them antibiotics. And that yeah. in turn comes into our system. So yeah. when you are looking for beef products, try to have them be grass fed out in a, in a field. Um, look for that and, and organic or all natural. They all have different terms. They all mean different things, but grass fed is extremely important. Antibiotic hormone free when, you, especially for your fertility hormone patients, PCOSers, because we already have so many weird hormones happening. We don't need extra from our animals and right, the right. cows in the pasture, they're getting vitamin D too from the sun. So you're getting sort of an added dose of that vitamin D. Okay. So, okay, so I'm going to circle us back in here. The, the, <clears throat> the three macros, the carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, those are the things that we need to build our body and exist. Um, we focused in on carbohydrates first because they're broken down into sugar, and that could be a huge contributor because of the standard American or Canadian. I appreciate how you keep including Canada uh, diet and um, and it lending itself to this maybe underpinning insulin resistance with most atypical or thin type or, or thin type or, or typical uh, PCOS patients. So, so we need to eat these whole grains, things that look like at least a lot closer to what they did when they were grown. There's something that was grown um, and there's a variety of ways to do that. And we need to stay away from simple white sugars. They're mostly genetically modified too, or, you know, these chemical sweeteners that are put in, they're pervasive. Is that a good summary for carbohydrates? Yes, it is. But I also wanted to just add one more thing. Okay. Um, the timing of those carbohydrates throughout the day is also very- Oh important. yeah, right. You had your three things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. I, um, a, a way to help you, yourself if you have PCOS is to put this all on paper, make right. out a meal plan and get a daily plan prepared. This right. is going to also help curve those cravings. Cause I know at two o'clock every day I crave sugar or like right after my lunch, I really want sugar. But if I know at three o'clock, I'm going to get to have my really, mm. you know, nutrient dense snack. I am willing to wait for that, but right. having a plan on paper, knowing that I'm going to eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks in between is very, very important. And that's going to help with those ups and downs with the burning of the carbohydrates or the production of sugar. And I know that a lot of women think that the less they eat, the more weight they will lose. And with PCOS, that is actually false in most mm, cases. Interesting. You, we actually need that small amount of food in our system at all times to keep our metabolism going, or else you're going to go into a hypocaloric state. So essentially your body's going to think that it's starving. Yeah. What does it do when it starves? It holds on to what it has. It's worried that it's never going to get another meal. So right. by skipping breakfast, you're actually doing yourself a disservice. Having a, pro a high protein diet, excuse me, a high protein meal as your breakfast is definitely more beneficial than nothing at all. And that right. could be a protein shake. That can be eggs and turkey sausage. It can be a cheese stick. It can be an omelet. It can be overnight oats, chia, chia pudding. It could be pretty much anything, but just have something within an hour of waking up so that you can kickstart your metabolism. I now you can correct me kind of if, if I'm wrong here, but I, I feel like I've seen, you know, over and over again, um, when caloric reduction is, is the, uh, and, and I think we know it's short-term benefits and it's long-term you know, evils, which, which it's not good to do long-term. What I see people that deprive themselves instead of giving new proper nutrition, um, you know, and eating as much as they want of quality foods 
um, I see this reduction in the quantity of foods because most of the quantity, most of the food is not of not nutritionally dense. So this quantity all of a sudden goes down because that's the way you lose weight. And temporarily these things work and there might be a little bit of result, but what inevitably happens is that your metabolism slows. And then when that happens, you're, you end up eating the same and gaining that weight back. And then even more, and it's harder to get back onto the horse because your metabolism's at a lower, you know, set point than it was prior. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mm. mean, it's without putting diet behind this, essentially it's like yo-yoing mm. you, your body, you know, it, it, it was, something was happening and then it's stopping. Um, and, and it's a, you know, you plateau, but then you gain it all back because it doesn't like what is happening. Right. And not only does your body not like what is happening mentally, that is not good for women with PCOS. That is giving you a, a bad body image. Yeah. Uh, it's making you probably anxious, a little depressed. There's a lot of emotions that can go into that. So, yeah. you know, if you are, you got to, if you're going to do something, you got to stick to it. Right. And you got to find out what's right for you and your family, because as a woman, you know, either you're, you're cooking for yourself or you're cooking for your partner, or you maybe other have other children that you're planning for, but you know, we, we are a amazing species and we can multitask like the best of them. So I know that you got a lot going on just like me. So, you know, having a plan in place and not going up and down and plateauing and having to deal with all these emotions that it's not working. It is working. I can't get pregnant. Yeah. I'm trying to do IVF. It's very important to, to have a plan and then stay consistent with that plan. I got, I mean, there's nothing more difficult than diet, you know, to, to get your head wrapped around, especially when you're faced with a metabolic condition or, or like we're like PCOS. Um, one thing that I, um, have also, you know, noticed is that when someone starts to eat well, it, like, I mean, there's that saying, uh, overeating, but starving, right? So a big plate of, you know, light brown colorless food, you know, it might be good, nice, complex, you know, carbohydrates, but most often maybe only a little, um, when we, when we eat that we're our body is, you know, still looking for nutrition. So it, you know, it's not satiated. So it asks for more and, and you think that that filling of it with that is, is, is going to satisfy. And when it doesn't, and that's the, the road up the, the, you know, with gaining weight, but when, when, you know, caloric reduction, that, that, that piece of where, okay, if I eat less, you know, that, that old adage, more energy or less energy in and more energy out, you know, basically eat less and exercise more is the formula just doesn't necessarily pan out, you know, and, and when people start to, to want to lose weight, they, they think, oh, okay, I need to eat less. That's kind of a default programming. But actually, it seems when you're replacing, you know, um, bad food with nutritionally dense food, you might actually, in some respects, need to eat as much, if not more, you know, because it's more leaves, it's more, you know, it's not as, as, uh, as dense, you know, a food. So, but if you're eating the right foods, you can eat a lot. Like you, I think we're kind of saying, and, and still uh, be on the road to weight loss or, or just a resetting of all these, you know, physiological endpoints, but it's hard to, to when that mentality of I eat less, I lose weight is, is so ingrained. You know, and to, and to add to what you just said, a lot of people, women, um, who are in air quotes, dieting or changing their lifestyle, you typically are adding in more exercise or ex any exercise or yeah. movement in general. And if you're not, you should be. So yeah, everybody listen, yeah. get out, get out and walk. Um, but you know, you're, you're doing, you're exerting more energy. So you are going to need additional calories during yeah. the day. Yeah. Um, just to, replenish your muscles and replenish the energy so that you can get up and you can go and do it again tomorrow. Right. 
Right. So while we are on the topic of sugars and, and insulin resistance, uh, just a basic picture, you know, for people, uh, insulin resistance is basically a point your body gets to with after years, maybe of inundation with sugar or just inheritable, you know, um, traits where there's been your, your cells start to say to insulin, no, I'm not going to let you bring sugar into me anymore. Um, insulin's job is to bring sugar into cells. That's, you know, simple. And when the cells start saying, no, it's a situation of insulin resistance. And you said, walk, you know, all you got to do is you got to start to move your body, you know, and, and if you're not, and just even walking is, is like so good. It's an aerobic heart range and it, it, it's a great fat burning, you know, um, uh, uh, exercise, but I, it's also exercise is a way that we can get sugar into our cells to be utilized without insulin. Is that right? Uh, yes, it absolutely is. And, and to boot, walking also helps with mental health oh, and, yeah. and overall general wellness. And we know that if you're undergoing fertility treatments, you have a PCOS diagnosis, or if you're just struggling to regulate your hormones and this, then walking and getting outside in nature is an extremely integral part of the healing process. Well, I know that, uh, oh, I'm amen <laughs> to that. I, <laughs> I, you know, I actually think that it's, it walking is as essential, uh, human activity as drinking water and, and breathing and sleeping. Like it, it's something that we have always done, you know, this running culture that's around. I don't think that's that natural. I mean, no, no wonder there's so much knee and back pain and it's good. At least you're doing something, but walking is, it can be a fast one, can be a slow one. You can stop to smell flowers. You can chat with your neighbor. You can, you know, just connect with yourself and watch the clouds, you know, or uh, it's walking is bar none. I, I couldn't have agreed more when the uh, ESHRA came out with uh, exercise guidelines, finally, for the PCOS population. And it was just simply 30 to 45 minutes a day of walking four to five days a week. That yep. was pretty much it. And I love it. <laughs> now yeah, you could, do. you could step into some resistance exercise too, which being strong is important, you know, if, and, and that can be yoga or, or whatever. And that's, that's another way of shuttling things or sugar into cells, but it needs to be enjoyable. Right. And who doesn't like walking? I know. And you can always use walking. What I've been doing is to uh, reconnect, you know, especially during the pandemic, all I did yeah. was walk, but you know, it can reconnect with somebody or you can, you know, people in our, in our world with PCOS, you know, call somebody who has PCOS and see how you can support them or text them, yeah. you know, try to try to advocate for the condition or, or lift somebody else up who is, is struggling or, you know, didn't get the, egg count that they wanted upon retrieval. Um, you can use it for so many things, especially with our phones these days. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to uh, mention PCOS certainly responds and the literature shows and the, the research supports this responds to better to low impact um, exercises. Right. And now, I'm not saying, more, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. If you, you know, if you're doing CrossFit and you're an ultra marathoner, awesome, you know, keep doing it. If it works for your body, that's fine. But if you're just starting to explore um, how exercise can help this condition, low to moderate intensity workouts are going to be your best friend. So walking, light jogging, nothing. <laughs> exercise actually is a <laughs> promotes inflammation. <laughs> it right, causes yeah. the breakdown of tissue and releases inflammatory markers into the body. Yeah. And so when you're doing these high impact um, things, you're going to get more in inflammation. And as we know, with PCOS, you have systemic inflammation and the goal is to get rid of that. Yeah. Um, so I, there's a channel on YouTube that I actually really like and that I give all of my clients access to it's, she's called mad fit. Uh, that's her channel. And she has um, 50 videos, maybe a hundred videos 
of, um, it can be anything from low to high impact 20 to 30 minute workouts. You're not going to really do anything with weights over like eight to 10 pounds. If you want to yeah. add more, you can, yeah. but they are, uh, workouts that can be done like in, she wanted she made them in your apartment so that you don't bother right. your neighbors so you're not pounding on the floor but you have abs you have stretching you have um, full body you can either sweat or not sweat and it's 20 to 30 minutes and if you can just do that like you had mentioned three to four times a week you're going to get that lengthening of the muscles and you're also going to get a little cardio and your heart rate up in order to burn fat, you want your heart rate to be above 90 for an extended period of time. So if you are, um, if you're an Apple watch or a Fitbit person, track it and make sure that you're getting above 90 to start burning a little fat for fuel. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, I had, uh, you know, I know a lot of that reproductive endocrinologists are better known as IVF doctors usually, um, around here. And, you know, there isn't, um, anyone that would anymore that, you know, with the, how conclusive the evidence is with, with PCOS that large and in part, it is a manageable condition with, with diet and lifestyle, but it requires, uh, it requires a certain level of, of commitment to it. And, and you've been there. So can you speak to that men mental piece? And then I think we need to circle back to macros. I, I want to, you to give cause kind of some boots on the ground, you know, uh, ideas for how people should fill their plate and eat through the day. But um, can you speak to that, 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 that commitment that needs to be there? Yes. Um, I, it's hard. Yeah. I'll be the first to say that I'll be um, all in for, 30 days. And then I'm like, eh, I'm going on vacation. There's a barbecue, you know, and it all goes right. to hell in a handbag, but, um, you know, commitment and consistency is extremely important when it comes to PCOS. Now I'm not saying don't ever, ever have a piece of cake, yeah. but reward yourself and do it sensibly and do, um, have a, an appropriate serving size. Yeah. And I'll go over serving size when we talk about macros in a second, yeah. but don't go eating a whole pie, have yeah. a small sliver of it and satisfy the, your sweet tooth because you deserve it. You have worked extremely hard and life with PCOS is not easy and yeah. it is up and it is down and it is stressful. And you watch all these other people get pregnant and you have pregnancy announcements. Um, and that is tough. I'm actually, I'm just sitting in my yeah. office and there is a family with a girl, right, a little girl right outside my window and the mom is pregnant. And I'm like, right. is this a trigger? Should I, you know, that, that should be me, but like, you can't compare yourself. So you have to focus on your, what you can do, what is within your realm. You have yeah. to think about you and your family, what you do from a day-to-day -day lifestyle standpoint. And then you have to commit. You can say, listen, I'm going to, for the next 90 days, I'm going to write out all my meals. I'm going to follow it. I'm going to treat myself to X, Y, and Z at X time. I'm going to cut out sodas and substitute with soda waters or something like that. Just have a plan going into the next X amount of days and then reevaluate after 90 days and see where you are or just say, Hey, listen, I'm going to commit to taking my prenatal every day, you know, like, yeah, you know, something yeah. you can even start with something so small if yeah, you're inconsistent. Yeah. If you yeah. have PCOS, there is a, um, a supplement called Avocetol or Inositol, which yeah. has been shown to really help with insulin resistance, but you don't actually see results for like 60 to 90 days. Yeah. So you can say, Hey, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to take my Inositol every morning and then I'm going to eat right and see where I'm at. Yeah. Um, Commitment does not mean standing on the scale every single day. Yeah, no. You know, weight loss is extreme. It can be extremely important. You know, a five to 10% weight loss in total body, um, total body weight can show, can have a huge impact yeah. on your PCOS and it could restore ovulation and do a lot of things. Yeah. But, you know, what is happening inside of you sometimes does not dictate what the number on the scale shows. Yeah. And so that is not how we commit the commitment to nutrition is committing to educating yourself on what you should eat, you know, listening to th this podcast, writing down ideas, and then writing down a grocery list and a food list. That's how you commit. Right. And, and 
walking while you listen to this podcast for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and then liking below and subscribing, yeah. right? <laughs> um, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, we have, uh, at Yinstall, we've developed, I mean, we've got a, a powder that we, we have that has chromium, a couple other things, you know, that have a little bit limited evidence to helping with blood sugar, but um, the d Cairo and myonostol in it, and it, and it's quite wonderful. I mean, um, yeah, you don't have to jump to metformin as a insulin sensitizer to, to right off the cuff. You can try some, there's some other things that can work like this diet and, and exercise and, you know, but it is something you need to commit to. And maybe you need to have, you know, come to me or to Laura, you know, regularly or once a month or something to check in. Or, you know, I think that's what, when people come for acupuncture or IVs, or whatever, to our clinic regularly, there's, or to their fitness trainer or wherever, there's that accountability to, that helps with that commitment. Cause, oh, Lord knows we all have difficulty with keeping up with, you know, being perfect when every, every advertisement in, you know, and, and, you know, marketing walking down the street is trying to push you towards some fast food or alcohol or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a tough world, you know, Starbucks and, and, and the like are, they're not really, you know, selling a lot of great food, maybe some, but um, uh, so committing now that we're ready to commit, we want to eat a little bit better. We know we need to eat good carbs, take out sugars, but how much, you know, how much, and where does fat and protein fit in? Sure. So um, in our teachings and in our literature, the, the breakdown of percentages for the macros are as follows from a carbohydrate standpoint, 50 to 65% of your intake should be carbohydrates. 10 to 35% should be fats and 25 to 35% should be proteins. So as a dietitian, I'm going to look at you. We're going to have a one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to talk about your lifestyle and I'm going to see where um, these ranges fall or where I feel it's appropriate to set your limits. Right. Um, and when it comes to PCOS, I definitely stick to the lower levels of the, that carbohydrate range. So it'll probably be around 50%. And then you set your calorie um, limit. Now I'm not saying count calories, counting calories is the only way to beat PCOS. But I think if you are just starting out, learning how much you're actually taking in and what you're taking in is a very integral part of dieting or, or lifestyle changes. So, you know- Connecting just, to the food in a, in a sense, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So like, you know, my husband is on this like huge protein kick workout, you know, and he was like, can you set me up on your app? And I was like, sure. So I set him up and I assigned his, his numbers and he was mind blown by how much he actually takes in. <sighs> so you, uh, you just, he, you know, he adjusts it, adjusts it and then logs and then, and learns. Right. So, you know, I always have my clients do it for 30 days as a learning tool, unless right. you know exactly what you're doing. It's kind of, I mean, it's like Weight Watchers. Weight Watchers has a point system right. based right. on macros and calories. Um, so carbo back to the carbs. You know, if you are uh, five, five, uh, 200 pounds and you are, you know, you're looking to get your BMI down or to lose 20 pounds, you know, I'm going to probably assign somewhere from like 1600 to 1900 for a calorie assignment. And then I'll probably do like 50% of your carbohydrates. So, okay. um, real quick, let's just say it's 1800 calories, which is kind of a lot for a female, right. um, depend, okay. you know, depending on if you have a sedentary lifestyle, mm -hmm. um, times 0.5. Let's assume they're out walking five days a week now. Yeah. 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 And then divide by four. So that's like 225 grams of carbohydrates a day. So if you're somebody that's like on my fitness pal, that's the number you would put in for your assignment, um, which I actually kind of believe is high, but you would find that, you know, with three meals a day and a snack that you're, you're going to probably hit that very fast. Again, um, if it's two, two plain white bagels, or if it's <laughs> a mixture of cooked broccoli and cauliflower and a couple of roots, it's a, it's, it matters as well. Right. Absolutely. So like, you know, a white potato and a sweet potato have the exact same amount of carbohydrates. There's 15 grams 
um, no, not in a potato, I'm sorry, there's probably about 30 grams in a potato. And they have the same amount, they each have 30, but they have different vitamins and minerals and fiber, and they're going to affect your insulin and your, res your insulin resistance differently. Right. Same with like white bread and wheat bread. Right. Or right. white wine and red wine. <laughs> Just kidding. So, so when you say 250 grams, that that does seem kind of high. But if it's good quality carbohydrates, that is okay. When we're talking stay under 100, that's when we're eating starchy white things. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and then if you know if you're walking, you should be having, you know, 15 grams of carbohydrates, or excuse me, like. So that's 15 grams time. You should be having, yeah, 15 grams of carbs before your walk. And then about 10 to 15 grams after your walk. So that alone is, you know, is 30 grams. You're probably going to eat around 40 to 50 a meal. Mm. Um, and then the snacks, plus if you're walking. So, you know, like I mentioned, like 1800 calories is quite a lot for a female. It could be around 1600. Sometimes, you know, I, I have like 13 to 1600, I think would is like my going numbers for a lot of my clients, depending on how, what your starting weight is. Okay. Um, so when it comes to fats, yeah. fats, I also believe are extremely important it's for a PCOS. Complicated, it's a complicated word just right off the bat, you know, and, and some people who may not be as educated, you still might be in the camp of equaling or fat equaling weight gain. Yep. Yep. Because that was the trend, especially for older generations, yeah. you know, that, that low fat trend that came out, mm -hmm. um, but friend, uh, fat is our friend, especially with PCOS, but it has to be the right fat. It has to be what we call healthy fats, the fats that are going to lower your cholesterol and increase your good cholesterols or your HDLs. So what are those? Those are your healthy avocado oils, your extra virgin olive oils, um, your coconut oils. Um, right. You're going to have fat in uh, full fat dairy. You're going to have it in your lean meats, yeah. your fishes, your salmons. Um, and that's where you're going to, that's your nuts and your seeds are extremely important. I feel like I, we, you and I should have a whole nother podcast on, on fat on fat and like specific foods or keto or nutritional ketosis. Um, but those are the fats that you're going to want to bring into your diet. I mean, if you have PCOS, I'd be eating seeds or nuts at least once a day. Yeah. And you can do that very easily by having your seeds in like a protein shake or on top of a salad, or you can use it to like encrust a fish yeah. is a really good way to do that. But those have some very powerful omega threes, anti-inflammatory properties. So getting those, you know, your hemp seeds, chia seeds. Um, yeah. Well, you could, you could seed, seed cycle. I encourage people on this, you know, on this note to Google seed cycling and, and eat like that. I mean, it can even maybe help, you know, create a cycle, you know, if you seed cycle, according to the moon, if you're not ovulating and not having a cycle and trying to work through PCOS and get those seeds in that oil. Yeah, that's great. That is a new, I just learned about seed cycling a couple months ago. I had mm. ne never heard of it. And then I did mm. some research on it. It is really cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. Do you I, I have mean, patients that have success or do you implement that in your practice? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we, yeah, we talk about it. We recommend it quite a bit. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's especially over the years with anything that I can do with a woman with uh, PCOS that in particular is trying to get a, a cycle regular again, you know, we'll use the insulin sensitizers like the inositols and, but we'll start. And, and, and I find that, you know, the, the moon is, is moves the tides of the world, you know, and, and it actually, you know, when women spend a lot of time in nature, they will sync up with the moon. That's why it's called a moon cycle and some, you know, in some circles still, um, I find it's a great tool, especially if people can connect with it. And I, that's, it's a technique I would use, you know, cyclical progesterone with, and, you know, herbal medicine change from the follicular phase to the luteal and, and you seed cycling and, you know, moderate exercise in, in the luteal phase and more aggressive in the follicular trying to use all these different cyclings, you know, to, to uh, help trigger a body back into um, 
um, ovulating and cycling on its own. And, and I've, I've had success over and over with that. It requires a lot of commitment. Like we, you know, you know, just stepping back to five minutes ago, what we were talking about, but, um, the ones that do have, have a pretty good success. Your body wants to find its way back there, you know? Mm -hmm. I know it's amazing what, I mean, when women sync their cycles, I am, it, it's a true thing. I'm, yeah. I'm mind blown by it. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. I, yeah. I just pulled up the diagram for seed cycling. I didn't know it off the top of my head, but it involves flax, pumpkin, sunflower, and sesame seed for those of you listening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's some adaptations to it and stuff too, but I mean, like you said, um, but maybe that's a good segue. Um, um, not all nuts are, are created equal and, and, you know, um, you want to try and get as, a decent quality nut and seed that is, is, has not gone rancid because that, and that could bleed us into polyunsaturated fatty acids and, and industrially produced oils. Maybe we can talk about quality of oils and which are fat. Sure. Um, where do you want to start? Do you want to talk about what? rancidity first? Yeah. What about seeds and nuts? Is there, is, is it just like go and, and start and, and don't be overly concerned and let Spence like complicate things too far? <laughs> <Or> <laughs> well, well, I'll keep it basic. So um, nuts and nuts and seeds have fats. Um, they have omega-3 fatty acids particularly. Yeah. So that's going to help to you know, keep your blood flowing, keep mm -hmm. the um, inflammation, yeah, inflammation down, um, help reduce cholesterol um, and triglycerides, but too much of nuts and seeds, nuts in particular can actually cause a, a laxative effect. Right, right, of course. So watching your serving size, which I would say one to two servings a day would okay. may, maybe one. Uh, would be my recommendation. If you skip a day, that is totally okay. Yeah. Um, but okay. you know, things like pumpkins, so different, and I, I would have to do a ton of research, but, or even go back into my textbooks, but um, different nuts and seeds also have different vitamins and minerals. So I know that like uh, pumpkin seeds have magnesium. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yep. And selenium. And, you know, with that, we need that for muscle relaxation. If you're having trouble with any insomnia or sleeping issues, increasing your magnesium. So increasing your nut intake can help with that. Um, also Epsom salt, totally side note. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Epsom salt uh, bath, good magnesium absorption. Yeah. Yep. 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 So, you know, uh, in your, in our stressful world of PCOS and you could also be low in mag. Um, so having, you know, a pump, you know, pumpkin seeds or, or baking with pumpkin seeds or using it as a topping or using it on a charcuterie board and inc incorporating um, those somehow would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. No, if you're, I was just, I was going to spin around just to keep it. I, I, I'm also conscious of time a little bit here for you too, but, um, and, uh, with, with, with nuts, I mean, salted roasted, or are we looking for, you know, as unprocessed as, as possible? The latter. So yeah. I would go with, um, unsalted as basic as you can get uh, from a nut and seed standpoint. Pretty, I mean, that sort of goes for all, yeah. uh, all foods. Um, why, why we don't want salt right. um, and added salt, excuse me, um, in our foods is for too much sodium. So you're going to have excess bloating. You're going to have um, a um, more work on your, on your organs, on your kidneys. If you're having, if, if you do are, if you're out there and you happen to have any heart, heart conditions, um, we want to definitely watch our sodium intake here in the U S the recommended daily intake for sodium is 2,300 milligrams. If you have any underlying conditions, it's 1300 milligrams. Right, and so right. staying under that is very hard actually. So yeah, I assign that to my clients and I watch them go over when you have just one processed meal or even an abundance of cheese. If you are doing keto, you shoot over it tenfold. And so you're going to feel that like puffy swelling feeling. And, yeah. and we definitely don't want that. Yeah. We also I, don't want to get dehydrated because yeah. that yeah. negates that whole like 
um, blood flow to the reproductive organs that we're trying to accomplish. Well, and I think hypoosmolarity or, or excessive glucose sugar in the blood um, creates a, a, de, a natural dehydrated state to most cells anyway. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and, and anyway, um, but yeah, I, and, and I, I would love to have an episode on Celtic salt or on salts period, but uh, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that's a whole other topic too, but the roasting also, you, you said salt, but the roasting also, you know, can turn a lot of the oils that we're looking for as far as benefit rancid too. So, so I think we want to, to try and get the nuts in as natural a state as, as possible is, is kind of the conclusion there. Right. Yeah. And with that, if you, you know, if you want to lightly roast or lightly toast, you know, pine nuts are lovely, oh, light, lightly best. toasted. Yeah. I know. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's almost dinner time here. Yeah. <laughs> on the yeah, East Coast. yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so that's actually a great way to bring out the oils, but we just don't want to turn the, you know, we don't want to take them past the point of, um, positivity. So, so oils can be, so in a mixture of, of saturated and unsaturated, right? So animal fats and, and vegetable and, and, uh, well, vegetable using that term lightly and, and nuts and seed fats are oils are, are, is fine. Right. I mean, I think people are really afraid of saturated fats. Yeah. I mean, so, well, huh, that's another big topic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. <laughs> but um, just for the sake of our listeners, you know, having some saturated fat in the diet, as long as it's whole and from a good sourced animal that isn't full of antibiotics and hormones. Yes. Yes. And if you don't have any um, underlying um, issues, so if you are struggling with heart disease or arthrosclerosis, I would definitely try to avoid saturated fats and stick to unsaturated fats. But the population that you and I are talking to right now, don't be, don't be afraid. I actually have a new client who says she doesn't like to eat red meat because Mm -hmm. of the saturated fats. And I was like, you are missing out on the fat to begin with, but B, you're also missing out on so many vitamins and minerals. You're missing out on iron and the, all your B's and your energy. And so we need that. I'm all behind vegetarianism. I'm not, I'm a little on the fence, some about veganism, but I, I, um, I know that life is harder to obtain, um, you know, a fair number of micronutrients, et cetera, minerals, amino acids, when, when you're not consuming animal products. And that's not what this, this podcast is about, but, but I, I couldn't agree more with you there. Yeah. Do We're, you, in your clinic, do you do um, micronutrient testing? Yeah. 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 I mean, not that often. Cause it's about as, you know, <laughs> any one of them is, you know, 500 bucks and up. So they're, they're a bit, uh, you know, it's not accessible to absolutely everybody, but I would love that. You know, then we're not just assuming what deficiencies there are. We can see it. Yep. And then you can address it and treat it appropriately instead of just doing broad spectrum. Yeah, that's great. Ideally, the first thing, one of the first things anyone do walking into the clinic is it's, it's an ideal scenario for me because it's, I love that test because it's actionable instant in the clinic instant, you know, you've got ideas, you know, and, and clinically actionable, you know, tasks to, to start checking off. Yeah. Same in the nutrition world. You know, I, I, I would, you know, I talk broad and I talk food groups that we know that are great, but if I can narrow it down to saying, Hey, have X servings a day of, of Y to treat Z condition, that would be so perfect. Yeah. 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 One last thing, and then I want to quickly do protein. Um, so this is fats. The last thing I wanted to encourage people to, and I, I, you can speak to it or not, but I want, you know, people to understand that industrially produced commercial cooking oils, like canolas and things, if they're not, you know, small batched, you know, and, and they're, there are some good quality. I, I encourage people to understand more about those because they are, we put them in the category of vegetable fat. And I think that's been largely why they've been so, so successful because, you know, we assume that they're good for us because what we're talking about, but when they've been produced 
you know, on large scale like that, typically they've been overheated and they've been pushed past their uh, oxidation point and they actually are going to be causing more harm than good. So when you're using oils to cook with, try and stick with, with good quality oils that maybe have a bit of a higher smoke point and, and always try and cook on as low a temperature as you can. Are you in alignment with that, Laura? 200%. Okay. Awesome. So protein, so enough fat, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to wrap us together here and just to get that last macro in what final, you know, tips on, on protein do you have? We're going to want to do, um, lean proteins. You're okay. going to, this will probably, this is the category that you should probably be focusing more on okay. uh, in, a, in abundance of um, when you are writing at your meal plan, you kind of want to have a serving of protein at every meal. And if you could possibly incorporate a protein at the snacks, this is going to fill you up. Mm. This is going to make you not crave your carbohydrates or your sugars. Right. Uh, and you're going to want to focus on those, those leaner animals. So, um, mm. you know, all the, all the animal products that we had talked about in the fat category are also going to have your protein. Yeah. Um, and then you're going to have that also with your, yeah. And your fish is, um, a lot less, uh, protein and well, no, some fish. Um, but you're also going to find a lot of protein in your full fat dairy products. And I, that's the second time I have said full fat. Um, and I'm saying that because I encourage all people, (laughs) especially PCOSers to really, um, not go on the low fat skim, unless you are looking to alleviate fats in general because of uh, another underlying health condition like um, plaque in your arteries. But um, full fat dairy has um, the fats included and it it is lower in sugar. So the manufacturers have not taken out the fat and substituted it with sugar because um, we as humans love either, we love the mouthfeel of fat. So when you take it out, they have to replace it with something else. And I don't I think fat instead of sugar is much better. So full fat dairy, your cottage cheeses, um, your mozzarella cheeses, your almond milks, um, you're going to want, you know, those have higher protein um, contents and you're going to want to focus on uh, having multiple servings of that a day. Um, And here in the U S we have now, if, if we're going to take all these different categories and sort of, put them in a picture. Um, yeah. We have something called the my plate. Do you have that up there? Uh, I'm not familiar myself, but it might be in dietitian world. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you're going to want to eat a balanced diet and you don't know how to do that. So we, ha- if you picture a plate and you cut it in half um, for lunch and dinner, half of that plate should be a fruit and a vegetable. And then a quarter of that plate should be a starch or a carbohydrate. And then another quarter of that plate should be a, a protein. Right. And you're going to want to have, that's how you should dress your plate for lunch and dinner. Okay. Okay. For for PCOSers for breakfast, you're going to either, you want to want to do a high protein breakfast with a little bit of carb sprinkled in there. Yeah. Okay. So lots of eggs and maybe, you know, maybe even, yeah, some some bacon or you can treat yourself a little bit there or even, you know, what's your thoughts on shakes before, you know, um, or protein powders and things are these, they're a bandaid, right? Well, or they're, they, they can help out, you know, they're, it's tough to cook three big meals every day, but yeah. And especially people who are, you know, you're a working, working woman and you're in a hurry. I actually, encourage women to have shakes yeah. in the morning um, because I want them to load up their uh, fruits into them and then fruits you know have your carbohydrates I, I I like when people for some reason eat carbs earlier in the day <laughs> that's yeah. just my, my thing um, but shakes in the morning with with a protein powder right. um, and that protein powder can either be like a whey protein or you could even do pea protein if that's more of your style, but pea protein is a carbohydrate and has higher carbs. Yeah. But the thing about um, that higher carb protein, you're actually, you're mixing it with protein. So you're balancing out that right. glycemic or that, that spike in insulin that we're having. So right. if, 
you know, for the listeners right now, if you take anything away from what we just talked about, always pair a carbohydrate with a protein. It is crucial when it comes to weight management, glycemic control and PCOS management. So no naked carbs. That's what I always tell my, my girls, no naked carbs. And so if you're going to have that protein shake in the morning, have it with your low glycemic index berries. So berries are loaded with your antioxidants, which help create, you know, help decrease the inflammation in your body, throw a protein uh, powder in there Add a seed. So then you have your fats, your carbs and your protein all in one. So right there, you have an extremely balanced breakfast and you can take it with you. You can make it the night before. Um, I always add, and I always have my girls add turmeric and cinnamon to their shakes. Nice. Nice. I love those two because they are anti-inflammatory. Um, Help with blood sugar. Yeah, it's great. Yep. And help with blood sugar. Turmeric is very potent. So half a teaspoon, if you can, if you can take it. Yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But cinnamon is lovely. So put as much cinnamon in there as as you would like, but, and you can always add greens. So if you're struggling to get your greens in during the day, it's a great way to hide them. Yeah. I fully agree. Yeah. Yeah. Fully agree. And I do that myself for sure. I, I'm going to end here. I wanted to actually kind of end on the naked, no naked carbs thing, because that was a great, (laughs) it's a great closer (laughs) and it's a good one to remember. And it might be in the title of the podcast, actually, just because I think it should be, but um, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, Clearly we got to do this again and maybe like hand pick a couple of uh, things to drill down a little bit more on because everything you're talking about, I'm like, Oh, we could talk about this for another, like, 20 minutes, you know, and, and, and we should, but for now, I'm going to wrap this together and thank you so much and let everyone know that we'll put um, all of uh, uh, Laura's contact uh, info in, in the notes of wherever you're, you're watching or listening and uh, to, yeah, if you've got questions, especially if you're on YouTube or whatever, you, you can put them in the comments or, or contact uh, Laura or myself and, and uh, we'll do our best to get back to you as soon as we can. So Laura, thank you so much. Thank you. And you are right. We could have kept going. Oh my God. I, yeah, I've <laughs> physically got to be somewhere in a couple of minutes. So I'm, I'm like dressed as we're talking here. So I <laughs> run out the door, but it was such a pleasure. And my God, I, we just literally scratched the surface and that just shows us how big a, a topic this is. I mean, we hardly talked about exercise and and just even these macros and where we could have gone with so much. I really appreciate being able to bounce this off you. And I'm sure people will get such benefit from today's talk. I know. I'm so happy we connected and thank you for doing this and, and advocating for us women. We need it.